Welcome, everyone, on this nice spring day, a little bit cold, but uh, it does feel kind of brisk out there, and the sun is shining, and uh, here we are inside for another of York's Executive Leadership Breakfasts. And those of you who have been here from the beginning, some five or six years ago, know that we provide this as a platform for opinion makers. And we have had, most recently, John Mariner, Joel Klein. In the past, we've had Christine Quinn, Lee Sander, David Nealman, and others. And this morning, it is my privilege to welcome a wonderful woman here today, a scan of a significant family here in New York who will address us. But I'm not the official introducer of Eleanor. I am just the welcoming. And so welcome Eleanor Tatum to our executive leadership breakfast. <laughs> So I want to acknowledge some people, as we always do, our fabulous legislators, some of whom are here today, our board members, and we have a new board member, Jim Fagan, who is joining us uh, on our foundation board. Really glad to have you, Jim, but all of our foundation members, thank you. Our advisory board members who've been there for York, over its 45 years, and who have been there for me during these six years. Welcome. I want to, of course, acknowledge our students who are in the house, and you'll hear from them later with questions, I'm sure, right? We have some benefactors today, for instance, JetBlue is our sponsor. We thank them very much. I know JFK is in the house. They have given some money for our aviation funding. We have alums in the house. We have retirees in the house, people who have retired from York as faculty but have come back. We really appreciate that you're here. We have some of our high school partners also in the house, some of our principals who are here. Thank you so much for joining us. We continue to work hard in partnership with you for the best for our students at the K through 12 level, and then when they come to us here at your college. We're making some new friends. I just want to acknowledge the gentleman from JFK. Uh, thank you so much for being here uh, from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, got your name here. Is it, is it Al? Al de Philippus, yes, thank you so much. I want to acknowledge another new friend who is out because he's intrigued by our FDA partnership, Emmanuel uh, Martinez from Green Hills Ventures. Thanks for joining us. Really good to have you with us. And of course, I want to just acknowledge our faculty. And I'm just going to ask those who are faculty, current faculty who are here today, who do that great work in the classroom and in the labs. If you would just stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much for the work you continue to do for our students. So you know, uh, I have a platform. You know I'm going to take a little bit of a minute to give you three points of pride and then to provide a public service announcement. And I'm looking at one of my fellow presidents that I didn't acknowledge, and I just said, how could I forget to acknowledge Jim Meiskin, such a good friend of ours from Queens College. When I first came to York, Jim came over and said, you know, Marcia, we're not competitors, we're partners. And we will work together for the best of Queens. And I'm looking at our Tuskegee Airmen and thinking, how could I forget to acknowledge him and the wonderful relationship that they've developed with our students. So to our Tuskegee Airmen as well. So my three points of pride and one uh, point of uh, public service announcement. Uh, during the course of this year, we have completed our strategic plan. So we are now looking to the year 2020. Our vision, our mission, and our values have been affirmed. We have claimed six values, including intentional interactions for students and civic engagement. And so as we look to the year 2020, 
we have the platform of our strategic plan on which to build. Joined with that is the exciting moment of having a master plan approved by the Board of Trustees. And that will carry us as well to 2020. It will allow us to build a new structure, we're now calling it the Academic Village and Conference Center, which will house our School of Business. It will provide an anchor for students in a well-deserved student union. It will provide a first stop for students coming to the college with admissions, with bursa, with financial aid, and, and registrar. And it will as well house a conference center, a state-of-the-art conference center, that will be used not only by us as an institution, but by the community. And as well, it will be anchored by a dream we have of locating in that building, which will be right directly across the street from us, it will be on what is now our classroom building, which is essentially a temporary 30-year-old building, which is about 40,000 square feet, and it will be 160,000 square feet. It will house as well a small but important exhibit in honor of our Tuskegee Airmen, and that is our pl master plan platform. My third point of pride is that yesterday, we had our Dean's List celebration, the fifth of such uh, celebrations in the last five years, where we honor the outstanding students with high GPAs. And our keynote speaker was Joanna, Joanna Hay, and a graduate of 2008, currently attending Princeton, majoring in molecular biology, let me get it right, getting a PhD, she's now a third year student at Princeton, and she acknowledged the great work of our faculty. She named five faculty members, and I just wanna repeat their names because it sounded so good to hear a student providing inspiration to our best by naming faculty, Dr. Arsov, Dr. McNeil, Dr. Schlein, Dr. Desimero, and Dr. Les Leslie Lewis, some of our fabulous scientists. And my third point of pride brings me to my public service announcement. Because in order to create and sustain fabulous young people like Joanna, we need money. And so you have a chance to help us raise funds on April 11th, when we will bring three more divas to our Performing Arts Center for our major fundraising event. And those of you who've come know that it's a fun time. We've had three more tenors, we've had Brian Stokes Mitchell, we've had Br Branford Marsalis, and now we have three more divas. So those of you who can come out and support us, please do. We have modest price tickets. It's a fun evening, and we really would like you to support us, to support the kind of students like Joanna Hay and other students who are in the room today as merit scholars. So that's my three points of pride, ladies and gentlemen, and my public service announcement. And my work is done, except to acknowledge our councilman who's just come in, Leroy Comrie. And now to the main course, in order to introduce our speaker this morning, our very own distinguished lecturer, Ron Daniels. Good morning. Well, that, those were extraordinary points of pride, but I think that uh, the model for your college is on the move, right? So I think our first point of pride is our president, Mar Dr. Marcia Keys. Let's give her a big round of applause. She has us on the move. Uh, well, it's a distinct honor to have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this morning. I've already been warned that I should not read this entire bio, and I can appreciate that because when I speak sometimes it gets terrible to hear all of these bad things about yourself. 
Uh, but suffice it to say that Eleanor Tatum is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News, the oldest and largest black newspaper in the city of New York, and one of the oldest ethnic newspapers in the country. Now, when I teach black social and political thought, one of the things that we talk about is the significance of the black press, and that we have the Amsterdam News as a flagship, not only for the city of New York, but when you go across the country and you say the Amsterdam News, it is recognized as one of the flagship newspapers in the entire country. Uh, she was appointed to this position in 1997 and, because, and became one of the youngest publishers, and I think that's important, in the history of the black press. As the editor and publisher, Ms. Tatum oversees a staff of 25 full-time employees. Under her watch, the newspaper is modernized and uh, changes have included a new layout for the paper and refocusing the content to emphasize more current uh, issues facing Harlem and the wider African American community. I think the important thing here is we often talk about where is the next generation of leadership. <clears throat> and in Eleanor Tatum, we see the next generation of leadership having stepped up uh, as a woman uh, in, when it's not always been easy for women in American society to do so to step into the footsteps of her father, who was an incredibly legendary figure in this city, and to do it with grace and charm and effectiveness. This has been an important step for her. I also want to note that she um, has been on a number of national um, television shows, including The O'Reilly Factor, uh, uh, CUNY Television, The Today Show, NBC Nightly News 2020, uh, and as well, she um, has done some work at WWRL, where I have a little stake every now and then. And we've had the privilege of actually working together uh, on Reverend Al Sharpton's show, Keeping It Real. We actually had a chance to co-host that on one occasion. The other thing I think is significant is that she remains active in the community. Uh, she is active in a number of community, on a number of community boards, the board of trustees of her alma mater, St. Lawrence University, where she graduated. Uh, in addition, she sits on the board of the New York Urban League, the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem, the Chinatown YMCA, the Manhattan Community Board 3, and a number of other important community agencies. Because of her extraordinary work, she's also been honored. She is, she's a doctor. Ms. Tatum has, been, has received numerous honors, um, including being who's who of, of the American women, the millennial edition, but I think equally important, a doctor of humane letters, honest... Ooh, wow, that's a hard word. Honoressa Kaze. I got to get that straight. From Metropolitan College in New York. Would you please welcome our distinguished keynote speaker for this morning, the editor in chief and publisher of the Amsterdam News, Miss Eleanor Tatum. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. He did read most of my bio. <laughs> even though he was ordered not to. And thank you so much, uh, President Keyes, for inviting me out here today. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, but first of all, I would love all the students to stand up because we're all here because of you. And I want to give them a round of applause. Thank you. you are all the reason why we're here. You are the reason for the being of York, for all of CUNY, for every higher educational institution in this city, the state, and this country. And there is an assault on education in this country, in this state, and in this city. Whether it be pre-K through 12th grade, or higher education, this is a fight that our community has been a part of forever. We have fought from education, from when we were in the fields as slaves, to right here and right now. And that's one of the reasons why the black press is so important today as it was when it was founded. Because we are there to be the voice of our communities when other people are not there. When the first black newspaper was founded, the editorial read, we choose to plead our own cause. For too long have others spoken for us. And today, there are still so many people that believe that they can speak for our communities. But they don't speak. They speak for 
want our communities to be, not for what we want to be. Now that being said, we have a lot of work to do. And a lot of you things that I actually worked on at the Amsterdam News were all about CUNY. Back in 1990, reporter at the Amsterdam News, I was up at City College every day fighting for open admissions again and for fighting the tuition hikes. I almost got arrested every single day. I was 23 years old at the time, and all the students, you know, I was one on the younger side of the students that were up there, and the police could never tell me apart from the students, and I would take out my press cards, like, I'm covering this. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, we won't arrest you today. But I watched these young people get arrested over and over and over again because they were fighting for their rights to an education and for the education of the generations to come. One of those young men was Adonis Rodriguez, who is now um, a council person. I watched him at that point in his very broken English, fighting for the rights of students every single day. These young people put themselves on those front lines because they believed that there were problems and there needed to be change. They didn't win every battle, but the fact is, we're still here. Mm -hmm. And we still have students of color in our classrooms and in our colleges. But that's changing still. With the rises in education of costs, with the cuts in TAP and Pell, it's making it harder and harder for our young people to go to school. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, and it just breaks my heart. We have fought so hard for so long, and yet we still have to continue fighting. You know, when these young people were first protesting in 1994, um, they were basically reinventing the wheel in protesting. Um, and they were getting it wrong sometimes. And I asked my father, I said, why didn't you teach them how to fight? And his answer was simply, we thought we had done it for them, for you. We didn't want you to have to fight. We worked so hard to make it possible for you to do. And we never thought that this fight would still have to be going on day in and day out, day in and day out. And I think about those words that my father said. And it tells me two things, that the work is nowhere near done, and that when we learn how to fight from the men and women that have come before us, we need to make sure to pass that tradition down so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Now, we are under assault. That's the communities of color and poor across the city, state, and country. There are so many people that do not want to see us succeed because we know what happens when we can succeed. We can do anything, anything. I mean, it's proof right now we have a president that is black. And I think there are a lot of people that are afraid of that idea. They're afraid of the idea that black and brown people can really take the stage and make change and they will do whatever they can in their power to stop that from going on. Because we all know how much power we hold in our hands and in our brains. Because the media images that they are given every day tell them otherwise. They bombard them with the images that they are less than, that they will not become, that they are dropouts, they are teen mothers, they are drug dealers, they are criminals, they will end up in the criminal justice system. They are just and still chattel. But the fact is, they, we are so much more. And it is our job it is our responsibility to make sure that these young people, no matter how far off the path that they may go, that we bring them back into the fold and show them the way that they can be 
successful because they can. Okay. And, you know, I remember I spoke at a graduation yeah. of uh, eighth graders graduating from middle school. And there was someone from the Board of Education that spoke before me. And the first thing she said in her speech was, and, and mind you, this was a brand new middle school, so it only had about 10 students graduating. She said, I know all of you won't go to college. That was the first statement that she made. And this was somebody from the superintendent's office. From the board. Board of Ed. I'm not kidding. I know all of you will not go to college. Now, <laughs> what do you do with that? As a young person just about to graduate from middle school and about to go on to high school and you've got every hope in the world, you've done well, and you're excited about your next move and your next move and your next move, so maybe that they too would be going and studying molecular biology at Princeton. But you've got this person that is supposed to be in your corner telling you, I know you may not all go to college. Well, I got up there and I said, in this room, I see future governors, mayors, lawyers, doctors, scientists, and presidents. That's what I see in you. They always say our kids are the future. But we only have that future if we make sure that we harness everything that is good and help to get rid of the negative. You know, the professors that are here in this room, if we don't inspire these young people, they may go down the wrong path. And yes, it is hard to be a professor. It is very hard to be a professor. And you're going to get some of those knuckleheads. We all know about them. But you know what? Those knuckleheads can turn into anything. If you just give them that extra time and that extra push and you tell them that we expect excellence from you and we will expect nothing less, then excellence is what they will give you. Too many times we don't expect enough. And we have to expect more. Because if we don't have expectations of our young people, they have nothing to live up to. We have to instill hope and pride. And if we, let's look at this place here. Let's look at York. We've got plans till 2020. A new building is going to be built. We're going to have a state-of-the-art conference center where we and I say we, because yeah, I'm, I'm part of this. I'm part of this fight. We will be able to move mountains. And we will be able to create future presidents. And that doesn't only go for York. It goes for all of CUNY. It goes for all of our kids from Jamaica, Queens, to the South Bronx, to East New York. We hold the future in our hands by making sure that we can instill a future in them. And we have to fight on every single level. On the local level, at the city council, at the state level, straight up to the governor, to the national level. We have got people in power, some that believe in us. There are others who have a different view, and we have to make sure that they are not reelected. And there are a lot of them, and it's getting worse. But we have to instill in our young people as well that they need to go out in the polls and they need to be voting. They need to know the issues, because these aren't our issues, they're everyone's issues. We need to fight for health care, for education, for jobs but mostly education because that's what leads to everything else. But at the same time, you can't get educated if you don't have a full belly. So from breakfast and lunch in the classrooms to the ability for young people to get low-cost loans to go to college and grants and scholarships, we've got a lot of work to do. And the black press has been on that forefront. 
We are fighting every day. We are fighting for our young people. We are fighting for our elderly. We are fighting for, for everyone because no one else is speaking for us. We only hear about black folks and people of color in the press mostly when something goes wrong and not for the great and wonderful things that we do every day, every week, every year. I mean, we've got a Tuskegee Airman here. We've, yeah. Just one of those bright points of light that we have in our community. And we've got them dotted all over the place. And those Tuskegee Airmen are something that represent to our young people everything that they can be. That they can do anything they want and literally take off and fly. <laughs> So I am just, I'm here today to say we need to work harder. And through the paper, we try our best to get our issues out and our messages out. But you know what? We don't support our own institutions. You know, how many of you buy the Amsterdam News every week? Wow. <laughs> well, you know what? There, there are copies at the door, and there are subscription forms in there. <laughs> and, and I expect you all to take subscriptions. Now, we have some high school principals in the room, too, right? And some high school teachers and elementary school. We have a newspapers and education program, free newspapers to middle school and high school. If your school, if you want 1,000 newspapers a week, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a form in the newspaper for that too. And we've got an Education in the Classroom uh, page, and this week's Education in the Classroom page uh, is featuring Dr. Muriel Petioni, who is 97 years young and still doing amazing things within the community. So we need to get our young people interested in reading newspapers as well. And Dr. Keyes, maybe we can do something with the, even though it's supposed to be for you know, high school and stuff, maybe we can do something here as well and get some papers on campus. <laughs> but I just want to thank, <laughs> I just want to thank York so much for having me today and thank the students for coming out today. This is a very important forum to have and I am so pleased to be able to be one of your many and I hope to be invited back again and I am open for any questions that the students or anyone else might have. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, the tradition is that there are questions and the, the usual tradition is that I start with a student but I'll just, I'll just wait for a minute and see if I recognize a student hand going up. If not, you can warm up students and that, yes, there's one. Uh, Oh, there's one. There are two, actually. Where's the microphone? Uh, okay, great. So why don't we start over here um, with uh, a student question. I think there's another student right behind you, and then I'll come to you. Uh, great. Given what's happened recently in Japan and in the Middle East, reporters are increasingly relying on Twitter reports for eyewitness accounts of what's happening. Please share with us what are you and your reporters doing to verify the accuracy of these Twitter reports so that you're not being conned into erroneous reports? Well, you see, one of the things as a weekly newspaper, we're not in the daily news cycle, so that makes it a little bit different. And a lot of the reporting that we're focusing on is from the Global Information Network, which uh, comes out of countries all over, over the world. And uh, they are very factual, and, uh, and the other things that we're doing is mostly focusing on opinion pieces of opinion and thought leaders um, from this country and around the world as well. So our reporters are not actively engaged in the reporting of this, but we're using outside news services. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, Hi, oh, my name is Nana. Hello. Uh, I wanna know, being a black um, newspaper, is it hard finding advertisement? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, is it hard um, to find advertisement, like being a black newspaper? Is it hard to get advertising? Yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> the newspaper business in general has been having issues with advertising. And when the um, 
the economy goes into a downturn, black newspapers are the first ones to have their advertising pulled. And when the economy starts to recover, we're the last ones to get advertising back. So that puts us in a position of really, really lean times and hard times. And so we, we survive based upon our advertising. So if you have businesses that you want to advertise, you know, please call. <laughs> but, it, but it is definitely difficult. Eleanor, how are you? Very well. I'm just curious to know, uh, of the people who are in this room right now, I'm not quite sure exactly how many people are here in this room right now, but I think you mentioned a few minutes ago, how many people read the Amsterdam News in here? I don't think I saw a dozen people hand up. Can you tell me why that is? You're going to have to ask them. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's why I, uh, and that's why I asked that question. And so it's when I'm coming to places like this that I say, we're here. We've been here for 101 years. But without your support, we're not going to be here for another 101. And we need your help. Absolutely. So you folks out here, you got to start reading the Amsterdam News right now. <laughs> Yes, www.amsterdamnews.com, and uh, we are going to be, there is a site currently up, but we'll be relaunching at the end of May, beginning of June, with an even more robust site. Hi. Hello. In my community, St. Albans, we have very little distribution of your paper. What I need to know is how we can get the papers in some of the stores in our communities. Okay, well, first of all, did you see the piece we did on St. Albans a few weeks ago? And at Slade Park? Yes. yes. That was a fun piece. And weren't those pictures great? Yeah. You know, well, we need to work on the fact that maybe we can get into some of the supermarkets out there. And it's a fight. I mean, Queens is really hard when it comes to trying to get distribution. That's why subscriptions are so important. But if you know of places where the paper could be sold, please let us know. And also, if you go to a newsstand regularly that doesn't have the paper, Please ask them for it, because one of the other issues we have with distribution in general of the paper is that the color of our newsstand operators has changed. And a lot of people do not understand what the Amsterdam News is, because they have no cultural awareness of ethnic media other than maybe their own media, which may be Pakistani or Southeast Indian or or, get, or whatever. So it's really hard to go in and make a case, especially if people are not asking for it regularly. So, you know, if you go into a newsstand and you don't see it, please ask for it. If there are newsstands that you know of that you would like to have carry it, please call the newspaper and let us know so that we can try to take care of that. Because we want to increase our circulation out here and out in Southeast Queens and St. Albans and Addislade Park and Jamaica and, and, and everywhere, quite frankly. But we need your help because we don't know all the places that are possible. And with your direction, we can increase circulation tremendously. And if we still can't get it there, let, let's get you all subscriptions, OK? <laughs> yes. Ms. Tatum, we certainly need to congratulate you on what you have done to and for the Amsterdam. Your mom and dad did a magnificent job on you. <laughs> and we certainly need to commend you for it. I need to share this with you, that growing up and hawking the Amsterdam on the streets, we used to have a way of saying, instead of Amsterdam, we said the Abidam News. <laughs> <laughs> it gave us an opportunity to curse and really not curse. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I really appreciate it. I subscribe to it. Thank you. And I look forward to reading your editorials, because your editorials deal with those people who work with and for us, and who work against us. And they're very pointed. It's not like some of the other tabloids that, read, that write about the uh, personal life of those who are elected. You write about how qualified they are and what they do for us or to us. We want to commend you for that. You. The other thing, uh, we appreciate the article in there every week, or just about every week, written by Dr. Dees. 
and I was hoping that we could have more reporters from Queens who would be able to write for the Amsterdam. If that's possible, please let us know. The other thing. Wait, wait, but on that, if there are people that are journalists in the audience and want to do freelance work for the Amsterdam News, we owe it. We accept freelance work, and uh, we would love to see what you can do. And we'd love more voices out of Queens. You may want to try through the churches with subscriptions and offer some kind of help to churches, and that might be able to increase the subscription rate in our area. Thank you very much for being here. God bless you. Thank you so much. And yes, we are trying to work with the churches as with the schools, and uh, you know, we just were part of the, um, the 60th anniversary of the East Elmhurst Civics Association's um, event, and we're really trying to raise our circulation in all of these areas because it's really important. And uh, we do want to talk directly to you, so getting stories about the community is very, very important to us as well. And because of this fabulous woman, we're actually going to be working on a story on the women behind and beside the Tuskegee Airmen. One of our reporters is working on that story right now. So we're very excited about that because that really is an untold story. And there's so many untold stories in our community. So if, if you know of some of those that we haven't hit on yet, let us know. We're really open to suggestions. We want to cover what you guys want to know. Good, afternoon. Good morning, rather. Um, I wanted to ask you if you had any personal advice for uh, students that are trying to juggle busy lives um, right now since society is so confusing sometimes. Do you have any advice as far as how to prioritize to get things done accurately as far as reporting is concerned and you know, starting articles and how to figure out what comes first and what should be left for you know, the back burner. Well, when you're writing an article and you just don't know where to start, just start writing. You just start writing and then, you know, with computers it's so easy to just move paragraphs around. Just get the facts out there and then Try to put them into an order that makes sense. You need to tell the story in a way that's going to captivate the readers. But just make sure, you know, just write down all the facts. Even if you have to start with bullet points and say, okay, this is the story, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, how do we make it into a storytelling, a, a way of telling a story that will captivate everyone with still getting the information in there? And it's, you know, it's practice. <laughs> It's writing over and over again. It's telling the same story different ways. You have to realize, is it a news story? Is it a feature story? Or is it a feature news story? Is it going to be something that's going to be 300 words or 3,000 words? And all of that takes shape depending on the lengths and the use. But the facts remain the same. It's just how you tell them. It's how you embellish them in terms of adjective use and whatnot. Because the same story that's 300 words, you can get the same information in there as you can with 3,000 words, except it's just going to be told a little bit differently. But for all the students of journalism in here, the most important thing to do is if you're trying to get out there into the world of journalism, is to be writing all the time. It's to be finding places that you can do freelance work, school newspapers. If there isn't a school newspaper, start one. <laughs> There is one? Okay, there is a school newspaper. So there is no reason, if you are a journalism student, to be leaving this school without a boatload of clips. 
You should be writing in that newspaper every single week. Because if you don't, you're not going to have anything to show for yourself when you get out. I don't really want to read a graded paper. You know, I don't want to see, oh, A plus on this paper, this news story. But it didn't appear anywhere. I want to see what actually got into the newspaper. I want to see what your clips are, what your stories are, what you have on the website. Like, do you have a blog? All of those things are important. And if you don't have an outlet, you know, blogging is a great thing, especially if you actually do some journalistic reporting in it. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a fan of your father from the time we went to Selma, Alabama and on. One of the things that him and I cried about was the inability of us to buy the post. Uh, many people don't know it, but when the post was going under, Tatum moved with us and some of us to buy the post. And all, <laughs> and all of a sudden, an angel from Australia came along and saved the post. I would like to simply say this. You told the truth when Obama ran the first time. You're going to catch it yourself when he runs the second time. Stay strong. We'll buy your paper. Thank you. happy to be here this morning and uh, you know I'm thinking about our young people I think person sitting here we know what the black cause and the struggle has been we've read it we know the Amsterdam news the question is with technology and with uh, the media being as it is how can we better have our young people understand and get information that I think in the MCM is very, very pertinent. In this age of technology, when everything is immediate, mm -hmm. have you thought in terms of getting that information on the internet, even if it's just a blurb or blog, yeah. so that young people can begin to understand? Because I think we are really losing the young people. Now, I can remember the Amsterdam <laughs> news when I was very young. I lived in Harlem. And every week, we had somebody who came down the block, Amsterdam News, Amsterdam News. So I can remember this. And it was a very exciting thing. We always knew when this person was coming from, the whole neighborhood used to come out <laughs> and buy this. And we really have to get back to this. And I think maybe we need to really try to move into technology. Mm -hmm. I will say, sometimes the information that you will get is already obsolete. And if you keep reading things that have already happened and it has been blurbed out elsewhere, it makes it hard for you. So I'd like to see if it's possible that you can do something on the internet to catch our younger generation because if we don't, the Amsterdam, die, Amsterdam news won't die. We'll die and we don't need that to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and you know, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, technology is so important, but at the same time, we've got to teach our young people that a two-line Twitter feed is not news, that they need to know more than that two lines. That's just a headline. And we've gotten away from actually knowing the issues. So while, yes, we do need to be, you know, we need to be in this 24-hour news cycle, we also need to teach our young people how to be media connoisseurs and how to really read media and understand what is, as the young man over there had asked me um, about the Twitter reports and I reports that are coming out of, um, of Libya and out of Japan, what do we distill as truth and what is exaggeration, what is actually fiction. So we, we've got a, a fine line that we have to, to, to balance there. You know, what we put out there on that 24-hour news cycle, but also how we teach our young people to find out more than just the headlines. Because you've got a lot of people that are just talking about these headlines and know nothing about what's behind them. And, and if we continue to do that, we're going to have an uneducated populace in terms of current events. And, and that is really, really a problem. That's why getting newspapers into schools is so important so that young people can see there's more than just a headline. There is actually stories. I mean, news, and if you look at TV news right now, it's infotainment. It, 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 it's not news anymore. 
And you know, and the stuff that is pertinent news gets 15 seconds or 30 seconds. The newspapers and some radio stations are the only place that you can still actually get real news. And that's only some of them, because there are other newspapers that the first 20 pages is all, again, infotainment. And, and we need to teach our young people what the difference is and what really is important. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello, Eleanor. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yes. Good to have you out here. Thank you. I just want to comment on the last set of comments. Um, I think it's critical, and I wasn't going to say anything at all, but you made such a great point because what actually has to happen is that young people need to understand that not only do they get the headline, not only do they get the information that is in the, the other papers, the other papers are other papers, but they need to hear the news from our, as you talked about it, mm -hmm. perspective. And that makes a very big difference. I want to reiterate what you said about our young people becoming news connoisseurs. When you read more than one article, then you have a full perspective and you can have your own informed opinion mm -hmm. and then know how to act on it. Yes. The purpose of news is to have the information and as all of our ancestors did, they acted on it. Mm -hmm. With the Underground Railroad was what Marvin Gaye called the grapevine. Mm -hmm. And we need to have our grapevine based on real-time information for our community. And again, I thank you for being out here today. Thank you. On this week's edition of the Amsterdam News, there's two front-page stories about the Obama administration's decision to go into Libya. Yes. And I was wondering if you'd be writing an editorial piece on that. Um, it's very possible. I usually decide what my editorial is going to be about an hour before I write it. <laughs> it, it all depends on what's going on. But I mean, the, the piece that we had by um, the editorial piece that we had by Malefi Asante. Um, you know, captures so much, and it's somebody that knows a lot more than I do. And so sometimes I actually leave those things up to the experts, because there are certain things that I can speak on very, very well, and I will, but there are other things that I just don't have enough history on. I did not take enough courses in college on those things, and don't have enough of the background. Of course, I have some opinions, but I want to make sure that the opinions are very, very, very well formed so that I am not just adding to the chatter, but adding to the real discourse and to the discussion. So on that note, we want to thank you so much. <laughs>